we're out here today because there is a vote that's going to be taking place in the Senate and in the House on whether we should kill more people in the Middle East. It's called authorization to use military action in Syria. Syria is a country that has suffered now a civil war for two years. 150,000, nobody really knows. People have already died. Violence never, never in all of our history, going back to the Stone Age, ever solved the problem. What solves the problem is people sitting down and saying, how do we make it so you feel like a winner and I feel like a winner? Is that possible? And the really interesting thing that's happening is Russia has come out with a proposal to take away all weapons of mass destruction from Syria and put them into the hands of the UN. That is so simple and so wonderful that why didn't we think of that? Why didn't Obama get on television and say, hey, Mr. Assad, I got a deal for you. Just let the UN, not the United States, the UN, take care of your weapons and we will not bomb you. So now it's in our corner. And the American people, by overwhelming margins, 60, 70, 80 percent, depending on who you're talking to, are saying we don't want another war in the Middle East. That's why I'm here. I'm 71, I'm tired, I want to go fishing. I want the damn politicians to behave. And in the back of my shirt, it says politicians to the front. And I mean that. If the politicians went to the front of the line and had to fight the wars, there'd be no wars. What they do is old men send young men to die. And we say that's crazy. Thank you. I'm just here to show that the American people, we are not, this is not us. We do not want this. Our politicians have quit listening to us, the voters. We have no power. The lobbyists have hijacked our government. And so we are driven to the streets en masse to show our opinion. We are tired of them degrading our water and our air all for capitalism. I grew up with the system. I like it, but no, you cannot pollute us. You cannot make us ill for, for monetary gain and then going to other countries and bombing people so that the war machine, so that they don't lose their jobs. They need to be put out of business. We need our money back for our people, for our social programs. We have Americans living on the street. That is an outrage. And the greatest nation in the world, we have people living on the street. We should be in the streets over that. That alone, we should be solving that problem and not mucking in every other country's issue. And really, we just have blood on our hands because we are doing it because of the oil, because we want to protect that whole pathway through to Russia. And what, we want World War III? So we can drive our cars? Excuse me? <laughs> you know, like, like the American people just, we, we do not want this. We are not behind it. And I demonstrated on Saturday at Director's Park with a family from Syria. And I talked to a lady whose brother is over there with a four-month-old baby. They do not want to be bombed. They are people like us. And enough, enough. We, we have already have 12 wars, I think. We, I've, we've lost count. This is sick. This is evil. I'm a Christian. Jesus would be here. He would be doing something. And so I am here. I'm here for all those reasons. I'm here because bombing people is never the solution. Violence has never solved anything. And, you know, the U.S. may talk about political goals, which seem kind of hypocritical anyway, considering you know, um, how much we're just uh, exploiting the places, trying to get oil and other natural resources. But beyond that, bombs kill people, and that's never a good thing, ever.
I'm actually just came out today mostly to spectate. I'm a blogger and I just want to share with my readers what the American public feels about the possibility of the American government uh, doing a strike against uh, the Syrian people for something that they don't have any control over. So we're just trying to exercise a democratic right and I just want to be here and to help record it through my blog. That's why I'm here. Okay, I can understand the must, you know, using chemical weapons, mustard gas, or nerve gas, whatever. I can understand that is cruel, inhumane, and everything else. I understand that. What about Darfur? That's, I, I just, I mean, if we're going to be humanitarians against, you know, people treat their people wrong. And I hear this opinion today. Someone says, well, you know, it's different. They use chemical weapons. Not unlike Darfur. I'm like, okay, machetes and guns, as long as they. Whatever, and then you know, it said, well, it's a possible threat to America because they can actually um, make something to go over here and attack us with chemical weapons. And I'm, and I'm like, no. I said, like, my opinion is, we burnt out our resources on Afghanistan, on Iraq. We have burnt out our resources. Oh yeah, we got the bombs. We got to blow them up. We have a, a our economy that's based on. Uh, on military and the blowing up things to make money, yeah, I, gu I guess it's reasonable to go and you know blow up some things in the name of humanitarian reasons, you know. And to me, you know, bombing do doesn't make peace. Um, to protect, how can I say, to bomb to protect your allies, Israel. I'm not, I'm not anti-Jewish or anything like that. I'm not. But am I anti-Israel? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am. I mean, I'm going to say this: building walls and putting people into condensed places. We got somewhere in the, in history that happened before, well, a couple of times, but one, like, uh, I don't know, whose policies was that? Was it like neo-fascist, like, um, like Hitler did something like that? So to protect people, don't get me wrong, should, should anyone be using gas? No. But should we also be involved after we done burnt our resources out and be involved in the name of humanitarian and to um, basically launch a... So uh, a missile command in the name of humanitarian crisis, whatever they want to call it, especially when it's coming from us, the ones who, what about Darfur? That's, that's, my, that's why I can't get Darfur, genocide. Oh, no, 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 that's, that, that's okay. No, 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 that's okay. You know, you know, they wasn't using chemical weapons, you know. They were just slaughtering them and displacing them and throwing them off their lands and all this for, for years and years and still to this day. But no, when, when Syria all of a sudden, oh, the Syria calls and say, oh, they're using gas. You know, oh, they killed about 1,400 of their own people. Now we gotta be humanitarians. I wonder if it's something about what's underneath them that they really want and there's a choir or something they can build in a big old pipe, you know. It, it, to me, in the, doing it in the names that we're doing and making excuses, I wish for they'll just come out with the public on the real reason. I'm not a conspiracy, but we all know what the real reason is. It's, it's all about oil. You were part of a Middle East peace coalition in the 70s, and here we are in 2013, yes. standing on a corner from the federal building. That's what breaks my heart. Yeah. It makes me feel like a failure. It makes me feel like peace is the one commodity you cannot sell in America. You can't give it away. You can't, you know, make a bake sale out of, hey, here, have a peace cake, you know. I, I don't know what to do, except just love the people who show up. Well, I, I like to think that what you have done is helped lay track for the next generation of peace activists. And if you hadn't showed up, maybe nobody would show up behind you. And, well, and what have you modeled to your children and your grandchildren? Well, there really actually is quite a story. I mean, yeah. because we, uh, well, for one thing, we're Quakers. So we worship with a Quaker meeting. Right. And they didn't really want to talk about weapons of mass destruction. Who does, yeah. you know? But we had to bring it into the meeting house. We had to bring that unsacred subject into the meeting house. Yeah. And so then you say, well, how do you do that? So we would give these breakfasts, and then we would talk about peacemaking as a possibility. And then they asked us if we would be representatives to the Interfaith Council. When was this? This was like the same time, in the 90s. In the 90s. Yeah. And so we became representatives of the Interfaith Council, and then we got some tickets for some other Quakers to go to an event. And one person was terribly impressed, and his name is Tom Fox. He became a Christian peacemaker. He went to the Middle East. He ended up dying in Baghdad 
because he was trying to... In the 90s? No, this was in 2006. Time goes on. Time goes on. So what we're really kind of doing is cross-pollinating and then all these fruits are, are evolving and developing, you know? Fruit comes from it. So you, you see the flower die, but you have to go looking for the fruit. He went there because he wanted to bring the story of Abu Ghraib to the American people before it finally did get oh, there. Wow. That was his mission. And you know people don't like those scandals being published. So the miracle part of it was that when he was taken hostage in Baghdad, we had already set up in Washington, D.C., a people-to-people -people communication network. You lived in D.C. at the time? In uh, Virginia. Nearby. Fairfax, yeah. Virginia. Yeah. And what happened was the Muslims who were in the Interfaith Council got with these Quakers. The Quakers said, we need to find Tom Fox. So they got on their communication network and got into Baghdad, the Muslims in Baghdad. And they started gathering information. So that's one of the things that's happening right now is that people, by taking direct action, person to person, yeah. we're beginning to realize how much power we actually have to solve our own problems. So small steps can have a big impact, like your small step of exactly. bringing that into exactly. a quicker meeting of your faith community. Exactly. It inspired a young man named Tom Fox, exactly. who went on to inspire people in Baghdad. Exactly. So, pretty soon that whole meeting, when he was taken hostage, the whole meeting came out. They made a special banner. Your faith community. Yes. Because when I talked to them yeah. in 1990 and talked about the Gulf War, you know, a lot of people just said, we don't know anything about it. By 2006, their own person yeah. was had his life on the line. You know what I'm hearing from you, Kalei? I'm hearing that war is a legacy. Yes. But peace is a legacy, a legacy too. And so if hopefully we stand peace, up to the yes. legacy. Because we overcome evil by what? With good. More good. Yeah. So we're gonna keep doing that fist bump. <laughs> and and I'm very much aware that the, um, the spiritually grounded people who work in the peace movement very quietly can make a huge difference, you know, immediately, but also long term by commitment. Yeah, absolutely, planting those seeds. The work I'm doing right now is I'm working on police violence against the people of Portland. <laughs> Just a little, little thing. <laughs> 24-7, you know, so this one becomes kind of like the little, the little thing. But it, to me, it's very hypocritical to tolerate brutality against the people sitting out over there. And then, and then yet, you know, the homeless people out there, they're suffering, they need help. Sitting all there, they want to have a conference or a conversation, and we're over here yelling and screaming about, you know, whatever it is we're trying to yell and scream about. Yeah. But, but what we really, really need to do is recognize the humanity of each other, but the sacredness of that humanity needs to be lifted up. It needs to come, needs to become, you know, mainstream, front line, headline, that, that everybody is sacred. Yeah, and trashing the sacred Stop being a hypocrite. D don't talk to me about morality. If, as long as you're bombing people, you just don't have the right. Yeah. Can I hug you? Absolutely. Thank you for your service again. And you too, Ted. Thank you for your service. It's a journey, I guess, is what I'm saying. It's a journey for you us. You inspire me. It's a life journey. But we, we didn't know we would end up here when we started. You know, when we first went to Saudi Arabia, we just wanted to ask, are Muslims human beings or are they monsters? Are they savages? Are they, you know, subhuman? And we got there and we loved them. We sat up with the Bedouins and drank coffee with them and looked at the stars with them. And, you know, it was wonderful. 
And I come back to America and nobody wants to talk about peace. And I'm saying, why is that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, what's, what kind of self-torture would we rather have when, when, when peace is so, so beautiful and so wonderful? A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard, dumb. The policeman's widow in veils faints in the funeral home. History says, don't poke on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise, and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe, believe that a further shore is attainable from here. Believe in miracles and cured and healing well and call the miracle self-healing the utter self-revealing double take of feeling if there's fire on the mountain and lightning and storm and a god speaks from the heavens it means Someone is hearing the great outcry and the birth cry of new life at its turn. Seamus Haynes.